welcome to the Fireside Chat as part of the Fox Hollow. My name is Skylar. And I'm Keelan. And today we're going to be discussing financial goals. So everything surrounding your money, how to budget, how to get out of debt, save an emergency fund, invest for your future, and more. So we're going to start off by talking about the power of intentionality with money. Because it's one of those few topics in your life that you have full control over. Basically, how much you make, it's kind of transitioning from our last episode with vocational goals. And you get to choose how many jobs that you take, what kind of salary that you're looking for with your vocation, with your career, or any other jobs. So you do have some discretion there about how much you can make. So you get to decide how much money you make, basically. But even further and more importantly, you get to decide what you do with that money. Every single transaction that you make, you get to decide what you spend your money on, how much you save, how much you invest. You get to decide whether you spend 99 cents on a pack of gum or $1,000 on a TV or even more on a car or something more expensive. It's every penny that you make you are in control of and i think what we see a a lot of is unintentional spending we don't realize how much money we're actually wasting on things that we don't really need or maybe even care about so that's a really important part of the financial goals discussion where do you want your retirement account to look like at the end of this year If you're saving up for a big purchase like a house or your child's education or a vacation, you know, like what are you saving for Christmas of next year? And how much do you need to save for those things? Yeah. So you're going to make those goals. You're going to decide how you're going to get there, how ambitious that you want to be. So that's our, our first kind of segue is making money. And the next step is budgeting. A lot of people are afraid of the budget because they find it very restrictive. But a budget is just like a diet. You shouldn't be like on a diet, like on a budget. It should be something that you are regularly updating, that it's part of your life. And you get to decide what you eat. You get to decide what you spend your money on. That's entirely up to you. You make your own budget. I've also heard people saying instead of the word budget, because that can be a very intimidating word Mm -hmm. to a lot of people, that they say that you're allotting your money. Oh, yeah. And just picking and choosing where you're spending your money. It gets the same thing done. Budgeting, allotting. It's the same idea, but it's less intense and in some people's perspectives, less restrictive. Right. And there's different ways that you can do this. Some people just automate money that they need to go to their bills and to their savings and then they, uh, and and to investments as well. So everything is basically automated how they want to and then the rest they can spend. But my personal favorite is actually the zero based budget. So income at the top, expenses, how much you want to save and every single dollar has a name. Every single dollar has a job. And that way, and you can monitor it as you go through the month. So I just go through and when I make a, um, when I make a payment to a bill or when I buy something, I just put it in the system and make sure that I'm not overspending in that category. So it's just like a double check on yourself to be like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm starting to get to my maximum allotment. And sometimes you don't spend in a certain category as much as you think that you will, and you can rebudget that, put it into savings, anything like that. And speaking of savings, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do after you make some kind of budget or allotment or other system with your money is to create an emergency savings account. Why is an emergency savings account so important? If you were to lose your job or your car were to break down or you, 
your fridge goes out of commission and you need to buy something bigger or spend more money on something, your emergency savings is there to take care of those things rather than your monthly budget and what you typically make. That takes care of your everyday expenses, every month expenses. Your emergency savings is for the big expenses. Yeah, and I would say real emergencies because if little things pop up, you can usually arrange for them in your budget or plan. Work around it. Right. You can figure figure it out. But for, yeah, big or emergency things that you just couldn't plan for. Typically, you don't just have like $2,000 sitting around in your checking account not being <laughs> used for anything. Yeah, most of us don't. So, <laughs> some of the lucky ones. But, you know, you've got to have a safety net. You have to have an umbrella for that rainy day because it's going to happen. It rains. And what a lot of people do is that they don't save, so they don't have a rainy day fund. And then what happens? They have to put everything on a credit card. And then they're paying so much money in interest. And that's what keeps people from building wealth. It's not only that we tend to spend money that we don't need or money that we don't have on things that we don't need with a credit card, which is absolutely horrible, but that because we didn't save enough money in our emergency savings account, then we have to also turn to the credit card as that emergency buffer, but that's just going to hurt us more in the long run. You're just going to be end up paying more than you should be. Which leads us into debt. <laughs> and there are different kinds of debt. One, maybe a lot of people agree that it's a positive form of debt is a mortgage on your house. Just because houses are very expensive, so you'll probably have to take a mortgage out on a house. Yeah. And many people recommend that you pay it off faster than what what you should be doing if you're taking a 15 year or 30 year out like pay on yeah it typically you take extra. 30 year but if you can pay more on it and get it done in say 20 years that's better than obviously waiting the 30 years or a trick that i've heard because you know it's recommended that you do a 15 year mortgage but a good point and lesson learned after the recession is that you might want to take out a 30 year mortgage and pay it like it's a 15 year yeah. That way, if something bad happens, you still have lower payments per month. So, I don't know. It just, it's what you're comfortable with. You can think about it if you're buying a house. But there are also really terrible kinds of debt that you can get yourself into. And as we mentioned, credit card debt is one of those that you don't want to have a lot of it can be the demise of some people. Oh, good. A lot of people. Yeah, the the high interest accruing everything is just it's really dangerous. And if you got into that debt because of an emergency situation, now you see the value of the emergency savings account that you shouldn't rely on a credit card. Um, and that's just a really terrible situation to be in to have to take out debt for that whether it's a credit card or a loan. But if you got into credit card debt because you're overspending, well, that's just, that's on you. <laughs> that's a huge problem, though. And it's something that you need to evaluate. And work on. Right. And then, of course, there's the student loan debt. <laughs> and Which sometimes is, most of the time, inevitable. Yeah, so... I in my experience, as long as you are staying in state, in state tuition, um, be going for a reasonable amount of time, you can work and get scholarships, and um, you can go to community college too to get some prerequisites out of the way, and you can save a lot of money, and you can most likely and most often get through undergrad without having to take out student loans, or at least not very many. And a good rule of thumb is that the starting salary of your job should be able to pay off the loan within one to two years if you're going to have to take loans out. Yeah. You don't have to, you know, 
pay it off for the next five to ten years. Like me. Don't. <laughs> I mean, if, and, and here's the thing, because master's, PhD, professional schools, like, like mine going to law school and um, medical school, dental school, these are definitely more expensive schools. So I'm hard pressed to say, like, I had to take out student loans to go and get that education. So I would never tell somebody not to do that if that's the opportunity. And what they want to do. Right. Because it's what I did. But just know going into it, like, don't let that student loan sit around and haunt you. I have $100,000 worth of student loan to pay down. But I have a plan for it. So if you're going to get yourself into debt, know how much that you can take on and what your plan is for paying it off because you don't want it growing and destroying your life down the road. The student loan is not a pet. It's not the same thing as a mortgage. You should not keep it around. Very long at all. No, get rid of it. (laughs) Pay it down. And it will feel so good too. Um, which leads us into paying for school and investing in your children's school. So, you know, college is getting more expensive. I see the, the worst, I don't know. I, what I see is like people who get into student loan debt the most are those that go out of state and go to private colleges and they don't have scholarships or they go out of state to public universities and they don't work, and they spend their student loan money partying. Don't do that. Don't do any of that. That's not what education is for. You don't go to a college for the location. You go for the education. So obviously if there's a really good school, like if your kid wants to go to Harvard, or you want to go to Harvard, that's a good education rather than going to a local community college they shouldn't be going out of state because that place has better parties or a better commute like not community but a a better party scene but i'd be hard pressed to say i think i think most public state universities are good they all have good programs yes they all have good professors you can't make an excuse for why you want to go out of state, generally speaking, unless you get a scholarship and can fully fund it, or your parents are footing the bill, or, or whatever is the case, it's not a good idea, because it will come and bite you in the end, down the road, and it might be a major regret that you have. I am so thankful that I stayed in Nebraska, in-state tuition, and I didn't go to D.C. at a private university. Can you imagine? My debt would be threefold what it is. I would owe over $300,000 for my education. Which would take forever to pay off. But guess what? At the end of my education, what do I have? A Juris Doctor? No, it doesn't, that, that's it. it. it that's all you have. Well, it, <laughs> and... and um, License to practice, I mean, it doesn't matter if I went to the $300,000 school or the $100,000 school. I still have a degree. You're still a lawyer. Yeah. So don't don't let yourself make excuses and don't let your kids make excuses too. Like, they're 18 years old. They're still trying to figure things out. They want to go party at Ole Miss, but should they be doing that? If you live in... Tennessee probably not I don't know and then also talking about your kids and investing for your children's schooling you should start saving them money for their college or whatever they choose to do after high school if it's Mm -hmm. not college starting their career and doing something like that start saving that money at age one Baby. Baby. Birth. Baby when shower. When they're a baby. <laughs> yeah, they're baby still, shower before you even have the kid. Them. When they're, when they're one saving. year old and they have their first birthday, instead of people buying them a bunch of plastic toys that they're going to outgrow in six months to a year, them. and they don't remember, and they don't care, they'll play with whatever you give them. Your hair, they'll play with that. <laughs> you... Yeah. 
you want to ask people to contribute money to your child's savings account, specifically their college savings, so that it'll help them grow over time. They're not worried about it when they turn 18. They know that they have at least a good portion of money ready to go for college. They don't have to worry about where they're going to get this money from. And even if it's like $30 a year saving in a college savings account, mm, mm -hmm. 18 years, that's Compound a good amount interest. of money. And oh, yeah. you know what? That'll handle a bunch a bunch of classes and courses for yeah. them. Especially if you're taking prereqs at community college, go on. I mean, you can you can fully fund a college education now over time. Yeah. You just have to start early. And I can say that having my undergraduate covered was a blessing. But I can also say from Keelan's perspective that not having a fully funded college savings account is stressful because it limits it limits your opportunities, I suppose. When you make that decision or like Maybe you wouldn't have gone to the four-year college anyway, but what about an associate's degree or anything like that? Like, yeah. now you have to consider, what is my capacity to both work and do school? Do I want to work for a few years? Do I want to take classes? It, do I just want to get a certification? Because it costs so much. And if that money's not there for you when you turn 18 and you're going off to college... You might not choose to go to college, or your kid might not choose to go to college because it will be harder for them. Or take out a huge a student loan. Yeah. yeah. And that's just really stressful. You don't want that for your kids. You don't want that for yourself. So, speaking of compound interest. <laughs> the magic <laughs> Great segue. Of, of compound interest. <laughs> Um, in time, because you're talking about 18 years and how much growth that you can get on 18 years. Yes. And that's not even, like, the magic number. That's not even half of your life. 30 years is kind of that magic number when you do compound interest investing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about investing for retirement. I love this subject. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so you're young. Yes. If you were to start investing for retirement right now a hundred dollars a month versus if i started was it you're 19 mm -hmm. and i'm 26 yes. so if we each just started today investing a hundred dollars for retirement that's a five six year difference you would be incredibly surprised at how big of a difference that makes and then versus somebody who's 30 versus 35 if they started investing. When you start investing younger, you have more time for that compound interest to accrue. So yeah, it doesn't matter how much you put into the account, but what matters more is the amount of time that you have to invest. So if you start earlier, you have you get to put less money in for the same benefit outcome. Yeah. Yeah, so when investing for retirement, I really, really, really stress if you are young, if you are 18 or 23, 24, you get your first job, open up a, a Roth IRA, contribute to your 401k plan, especially, well, especially if there's a match. I wouldn't necessarily go to the 401k if there's not a match, just because you're limited in the kinds of investments that you have in there. But if you have the match at work, invest up to the match in some good mutual funds, a good mix of things. If you're 18, let me just say, when I was 18, I worked at a restaurant and I didn't really spend much of my money. So mom suggested that I open up a Roth IRA and she helped me set it up. I put $3,000 in there, how much I made for that year. And over the course of around eight years, it doubled in growth. So I have almost $7,000 in there. Not touching it. I didn't add anything else to it. I just let it sit and it, it grew. At, so like if you're 18, you just put $1,000 into an account, you know, graduation money, whatever. Yeah. Well, you have to have worked for it. But, you know, if, 
as long as you made a thousand dollars that year and then you were also gifted a thousand dollars for instance just put that money into a Roth IRA that's gonna make a huge difference I can't even stress how big of a difference that makes if you start investing for retirement when you're younger some people wait until their 40s and that's really stressful to try to save that much money yeah in a short period of time they have to work harder they have to put more money away to be able to do that now it's never too late to invest but just know that you would have to work much much harder the longer that you wait yeah and to get to the same place that somebody who if you started at 18 versus 40 then the difference yeah and even if you're 18 and you put 50 dollars away per month yeah it you builds know, up what, whatever you can put in there put in there even per week if it it makes more sense to you to put money away per week to automate it whatever it is like just invest and for retirement investing i would do it fairly consistently so on a month by month basis bi-monthly weekly whatever you're just putting a set amount away to your retirement accounts through mutual funds or ETFs or however you like to invest. Just make it really simple, make it consistent. But then I also wanna talk about value investing. So we live in Nebraska, which is home to Warren Buffett, one of the greatest value investors out there. Yes. So with your retirement accounts, again, doing consistent investing is best. But if you're trying to build wealth and you're out of debt and if you have kids you saved up for their education or you're in a good place, you're in your career, you should really consider value investing. If you have some time to spend to research good businesses and stocks, value investing is just going out and when the business is underpriced, you go out and buy the stock and it will grow and it will build you wealth. So there are some really great companies out there. And of course, we just went through a patch where the market was really high and it wasn't a great time to buy most any company. No. All the good ones were like super overpriced. You don't wanna buy a stock when it's overpriced. You wanna wait until the stock market crashes or there's a correction or there's some kind of turmoil going on with the company that everyone's freaked out about, but you know is not a big deal. It's just a temporary thing. But people overreact. People do. And the stock market shows that. When people overreact, when they get fearful, that's the time that you, you want to buy. When good companies are on sale. So if everything is going well in your life, you're out of debt, you're on track for your retirement, do an individual wealth account, like just buy some stocks, see how it goes. Um, You can buy buy and hold, these are long term, so you're, you're thinking about the next 10 years. Don't be investing in stocks if you're gonna be buying a house in the next few years and you think it's a good way to make extra money. The stock market moves around in the short term. So that's not wise. But if you're buying and holding for the next 10 years, it's a really great way to build wealth and do seed investments with dividends. You can also do this um, if you're interested in real estate. You can buy real estate and rent it out. And it's the same kind of thing. Just finding alternate revenue streams especially when you are stable in your financial life is really critical to building wealth. Yeah. And then, you know, if you lose your job, you have alternate revenue streams. You don't, you're not going to be as anxious. You have things to fall back on. Right. Just like that emergency savings. mm -hmm. You also have your investments that if you go through something and you've had these investments for a long period of time, you then sell them so that you can pay for some things. It's yeah. I did that. Yeah. So I had some investments throughout undergrad. I don't know. My parents were just like, here, invest some money. 
<laughs> they get and, that. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, I mean, sometimes they have really good principles that they they um, helped us out with, but then didn't necessarily follow themselves, but, you know, whatever. It's, it is what it is. They've invested their money. <laughs> yeah, so I did have, you know, a few thousand dollars worth of investments, and that helped me pay for the bar exam. So I just cash those out and that alleviated a lot of stress so some people use value investing too if they think that I'm gonna start a business way down the road so this is gonna be my startup right instead of just putting in a savings account and I do stress the importance like you do need an emergency savings account like in cash in the bank account ready to go just in case something happens but at a certain point, and that's usually three to six months of expenses. Um, but beyond that, you don't want to keep too much of your money in the bank. And the reason being is because it's not working for you, first of all. It's not gaining anything. You're not getting interest out of it. Just the same thing uh, with, with interest. The problem with credit cards is that you're paying that interest. And the great thing with investments is that those investments are paying you interest. You want to be paid interest. You don't want to be paying interest. Um, but then also, there's this little matter of inflation. Inflation is usually 2 to 3% or has historically been. So if you leave $1 in the bank and it's not making you any money, it's actually losing value over time. And people think, like, oh, it's safe to leave all of my money in savings. How is it safe to lose 3% per year? Yeah. Versus even a conservative investment in the stock market at 5%. Like, what? How does that make sense? Like, you know that you're going to lose 3% on that dollar if you leave it. That's not smart. No. So, look to value investing and, and seed money to build wealth. And why do you want to build wealth? What's the ultimate outcome? You have financial security. You know that you can feed your family. You know that you'll be okay in retirement. It makes your life less stressful. Right. But then if you build wealth, and and even if you don't have very much money, I think it's really important to do this too. But one of my main goals for building wealth is charitable giving. The more money you make, the more money you have, the more that you can give away to people in need. Yeah. I think that's so important. And a good why. You know, you want to change your family tree. You want to build a legacy. That's a good why. You want to sleep at night knowing that your finances are in order. Or that when you die that your money is going to go on to a charity or your relatives. And that they're going to be taken care of. That's a big why. Why? charitable giving you know that the more money that you make the more that you can give away to people and organizations that you really care about like those are all reasons why you should care about your finances not just that you should do it period why is it important to you to get your financial why is it important for you to get your finances straight in 2019 and that's a really personal question but for me it's to give do you have a why not yet no, not really not really <laughs> not You're yet still really young though yes i mean from my perspective just like the why of getting my finances in order it's just seen as me being 19 seen elders and just people even 10 years older than me struggle with money mm. that's not something that I want to go through mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of millennials were starting to get better with money so that we don't end up in tons of debt and struggling when we're 30 to buy a house and we don't know how this works right and we lived through the 
Great Recession. Yeah. And that was traumatic, I think, for a lot of millennials. And then our great-grandparents lived through the Great Great Depression. Depression. (laughs) So we have a lot of... Intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Money. (laughs) And you get a lot of... you, You get taught a lot from that. From every everybody else's perspective, from great grandparents going through the Great Depression, they put that on you growing up. My parents or our parents were growing up. Our parents learned to be more conservative with their money and not just spend it on frivolous things and a lot of people growing up is like eat all the food on your plate because whatever reason and I mean we were we were taught to always take leftovers and you know reuse the the food that we had because things are expensive they really are I think a lot of people get into poor spending habits they don't realize how much they're spending and they end up spending going out to eat every day too often yeah learn how to cook it'll save you so much money take a class food take a class and learn how to cook and that'll be something that you need and it's the first thing on your list that you should pay for Mm -hmm. if you're making a budget or a list of things to buy like you have to eat first Okay. Bills, like your electricity and whatever, and then food. <laughs> no, food first. Food first. Why, why would... It doesn't matter if you have the lights on if you can't eat. True. But you're starving <laughs> on the... Like, <laughs> starving on the floor. Like, people get really stressed out about their credit card bills and, and other bills that they have, medical debt, stuff like that. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You eat first. You feed your children first. For sure. That is the first thing that you do. Then you keep the lights on and the, the heat on. And then a roof over your head. The rent, the mortgage. Then gas up your car so you can drive to work. And then you start worrying about all that other stuff. Take care of your necessities first. Food is so important. And that does not mean go out to eat. If you are struggling, you should not be going out to eat. It's way cheaper Period. to just walk down to the grocery store and buy some food there and make it yep not that hard tacos at home rather than taco bell they're better anyway (laughs) exactly there any final statements that we want to make on financial goals not really anything you have to i guess i would just say that everybody's financial goals are going to be different but there are some overarching things that we discussed today that can help you navigate what some of your goals might be looking like and just be consistent with it and you're going to mess up you're going to overspend sometimes and give yourself grace in that process but you can do it we believe in you um if you have any financial goals um please leave those in the comments we would like to hear from you and if you have any ideas for other things that you'd like us to cover on the podcast you should also leave those in the comment section and if you're interested in a more in-depth financial education you should really check out our video series called foxy finances that'll be starting in march of 2019 and next week we'll be discussing relationship goals on finding a partner, building trust and communication, and valuing friendships. If you like what we're doing here, please consider becoming a supporter of the show. The Fireside Chat Podcast is part of a new entertainment hub called The Fox Hollow. We'll have shows about money, gaming, music, legal comedy, and more on YouTube, and we post new Fireside Chat episodes every Monday. If you'd like to ask a question or submit a public comment to be shared on the podcast, please email us at thefoxhollowhub at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support the podcast, please become a patron by donating at patreon.com slash thefoxhollow, linked in the description below. You can follow us on Instagram at thefoxhollow.yt. And if you like what you hear, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss another podcast or video. 
Also, speaking of financial goals and investments, if you haven't checked out Robin Hood Debt, oh my god, debt. <laughs> So speaking of investment and financial goals, if you haven't checked out Robinhood yet, you definitely should. Robinhood is an online investing and banking app. They give power back to the people by not charging fees or commissions when you go to buy and sell stocks. Please use this referral link to get started. Share.robinhood.com slash S-C-H-U-Y-L-G-7. You'll receive one free share of a random stock and you have the chance to win some big name investments like Apple and Berkshire Hathaway. By using this referral code, both you the listener and myself will receive a random share of stock. This is a great way to give back to the show while also getting a gift in return. We post new podcasts on Mondays. Thank you so much for listening and see you next week. Bye!